French ship Toulon, Aboukir Bay, August 1st, 1798. Away from the flames! Come about! Yells Captain Dupatit Fuaz. The British under Admiral Nelson had hit them just before dusk, initiating a bloody night battle and somehow getting behind the French defensive line. Dupatit Fuaz had pulled out of line to engage the British ship Majestic, pounding it to splinters, but at great cost as return fire severed both of his arms and one of his legs. Now, he sits upright in a bucket filled with grain, directing his crew with bloody stumps. Get distance! Away! Away! Their flagship, the Orient, is afire, and Toulon is too close. If the flames were to reach the magazine, it could... A white flame fills the sky. The crew turns stunned. The Orient is gone. Dupatit Duas tells them to shake it off and continue the fight. In fact, his last order is to nail the colors to the mast, signaling there'll be no surrender. Two days later, when the surviving crew finally give up, the French fleet has been destroyed. Napoleon may rule Egypt, true, but it is Nelson who rules the waves. Thanks so much to 80,000 Hours for sponsoring this episode. If you're looking for a career path that can have a positive impact on the world, then stick around until after the episode because they just might be able to help you find your dream job for free. After the Battle of the Pyramids on July 21st, 1798, Napoleon marched on Cairo, becoming master of Egypt. Then, as he had done in other places like Malta and Alexandria, he immediately went about reforming the city on the new French model. He set up local directories, councils basically, in towns and villages. He set up courts that made declarations granting more rights and freedoms to women. He enlisted Egyptian Copts, a local sect of Christianity, to fulfill their already prominent role as administrators and financial workers. And finally, most importantly, he had the army gather together representatives of a very specific trade. Bakers! who were immediately given a crash course on how to make a decent baguette because you have to focus on the hierarchy of needs. Am I right? I mean, what, am I going to eat my jambon bar on, like, wheat bread? Come on. Next, Napoleon sent word to Al-Azir Mosque, summoning the highest-ranking clerics to his presence. When they came before him, he saw that they were all pale. Some even shook. They feared they would be killed. <laughs> no! Napoleon burst out laughing. He told them to relax. He wasn't there to take their heads. He was there to make them the heads. He wanted a council to advise him in leading Egypt, and he wanted them to do it. This actually appealed to them, and was quite the savvy move by Bonaparte. See, the Ottomans very specifically avoided entrusting political power to the Egyptians, and especially to local religious figures. And the whole reason they'd picked the Mamelukes as their ruling caste, slave soldiers brought in from the Caucasus with no local ties, was that they thought a foreign elite would be more loyal, and in the Ottoman Empire, civil figures ruled over religious ones. Further, the Ottomans had always insisted that their own clerics serve as final authority in interpreting religious law, so this was an opportunity for the scholars of Cairo to steer religion in Egypt. So Napoleon's tease of giving the clerics both civil power and religious autonomy was so tempting that they decided to see how it played out. Napoleon, for his part, saw an alliance with Egyptian religious authorities as a way of keeping control of the country. This was 100% a cynical move, mind you, considering that the French Revolution itself had frequently cited organized religion as corrupt and immoral and insisted its institutions be secular. Officially, you could practice any religion you wanted in private, but it was supposed to be kept out of the government and the public sphere. Unofficially, though, religion was often looked down upon, and the Revolutionary Army was famous for sacking and despoiling heavily Catholic regions, even within France. However, Napoleon was pragmatic. While he personally looked down on religion, he also considered it an excellent tool to manipulate people. And that was exactly what he tried to do, releasing numerous statements about his great respect for Islam and its compatibility with French ideals. And he needed that support, because oh boy was he in trouble. Napoleon was chasing the forces of Ibrahim Bey towards Syria when he got the news that his fleet had been destroyed and he was effectively trapped in Egypt. The one small mercy here was that the French fleet had at least damaged Nelson's ships badly enough that he couldn't stay in the area, going back to a friendly port to refit and drop off the multiple ships he'd captured. Though back in the negative column, the destruction of the Orient had sent the treasure of Malta, which was supposed to fund this whole Egyptian expedition, to the bottom of the bay. 
And to add insult to injury, the British also captured a cache of mail headed back to France, which included several letters of French officers and savants talking about how miserable they all were, and a letter from Napoleon himself to his wife Josephine, where he lividly cursed her out for carrying on an affair while he was gone. Oh, yeah, the British published all of those. Like, cold-bloodedly showed all the receipts. With this defeated sea, Bonaparte now found his supply lines, communications channels, and evacuation route to France had all essentially been cut. And he hadn't even fully defeated the base. Ibrahim was waiting in Syria with his army, and Murad had started a guerrilla insurgency in Upper Egypt. Modern French tactics were far less effective in this fast-moving type of war, and commanders quickly found that in a battle of cavalry versus cavalry, the Mameluk horsemen were more than a match for them. But also, Murad and Ibrahim were playing the long game. See, years before, the pair, who'd governed Egypt on behalf of the Ottomans but were semi-autonomous, had actually revolted against Ottoman rule and been exiled after an invasion. But back then, they'd simply waited until the Ottomans had a different insurgency on their hands and then struck a deal with them to return to power. They figured all they had to do here was kind of the same thing. Wait for Napoleon to fail and then come roaring back. So Napoleon doubled down on trying to make Egypt into a secure long-term position. He tried to become an Ottoman-style ruler in a way that would appeal to Egyptians, leading the festivities at the annual Festival of the Nile and the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. He even sponsored a dinner symposium among Cairo's religious scholars, where he appeared in a turban and a robe, declaring himself the champion of the Prophet, and claiming he wanted to unite all wise people under one regime founded on the principles of the Quran. Yeah. When one scholar told him the best way to get Egyptians to accept his rule would actually be for him and his army to convert, Napoleon did briefly consider whether he'd take that step. Eventually, though, he turned it down. Tactfully, of course, saying that his soldiers would not accept it. They liked their wine, after all, and, you know, probably wouldn't agree to mass circumcision. And I think at this point, it's important to be very clear. This entire thing was a political dance. Napoleon faked an interest in Islam, and the scholars pretended to believe him. But meanwhile, he tightened his grip. At first, he'd promised to do away with the Mameluk high taxes, but now he implemented them for his own benefit. He extracted tithes and fines from the wives of Mameluk officials that returned to Cairo, and investigated taxing pilgrim caravans. He also ruled with fear. In one letter, he casually mentioned that he was beheading five to six people a day in Cairo. And Cairo citizens felt general discomfort living under Christian rulers. They complained to each other that the French were dirty, tyrannical, that they favored Christians over Muslims, and that they sexually assaulted women, raiding harems to kidnap slave girls as their concubines. And though they claimed to be anti-slavery, officers were still buying men and women at slave markets. Then, low-level resistances plagued the French in Cairo. Bedouins kidnapped and killed soldiers. Upper-class citizens avoided Napoleon's public appearances. The French quickly learned not to walk off alone, and the revolts in Lower Egypt kept the army tied down. Heck, even the French-trained bakers weren't safe. Mobs actually chased them off and smashed their ovens. Then, on October 21st, rallied by a manifesto calling for all French to be killed, Cairo rose up. Mobs filled the streets, setting up barricades and attacking soldiers. The revolt centered around Al-Azir Mosque, where thousands of students joined the combat, and peasants, used to being mobilized by Ottoman armies, took up weapons as well. The French then stationed cannons atop the city's highest tower and bombarded the rebel-held districts. Later that night, Napoleon pushed out into the city, French soldiers fighting house to house and destroying barricades. And by the next morning, he had the whole city apart from Al-Azir Mosque itself. The people inside called for God to help them, with Napoleon supposedly responding, He is too late. French cannons smashed the walls, opening gaps, then French troops stormed in. According to his memoir, General Alexandre Dumas led that assault. However, in later paintings, the general, then out of favor, was replaced by Napoleon himself. When the smoke cleared, 6,000 citizens of Cairo lay dead or wounded, and one thought plagued Napoleon's mind. I have got to get out of here, which is a sentiment I'm betting a few of you out there have felt at least once or twice in your life without even being an egotistical French military commander. I know I have. And that's why this week's sponsor, 80,000 Hours, is a group I'm super excited to tell you about. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit whose goal is to help folks find fulfilling careers that have a strong social impact. And their work, based on 10 years of research with academics from Oxford University, can help you find a job that makes a positive difference in the world doing something that you love that also could help tackle some of the largest problems facing 
saving humanity today. Now, truth be told, we've never had a sponsor quite like this before, so we reached out and chatted with Bella over 80,000 hours to better understand their process and find out more about what their services were all about. And we learned they've got a ton of career research on their website for everyone to check out, lots of decision-making tools, such as their eight-week career planning course, and their podcast, which hosts unusually in-depth conversations with experts about how best to tackle pressing global problems, but really what blew us away was their job board. With just tons of listings that, based on all of their research, have the best chance of helping make the world we all live in a better place. And again, because they are a nonprofit that is philanthropically funded, there is no end game gotcha mechanic or hidden paywalls or anything. All of their material is free always. So if that sounds like something you think would be helpful in your current job or in helping you find a new career that you can feel great about, then you should sign up for their free newsletter via the link below. Then to start, they'll send you an in-depth guide that takes you through all the steps in making the best career plan for you and your 80,000 working hours that, on average, you'll spend in your lifetime. Look, I know figuring out what you want to do with your life is not easy. It took me way too long, personally. But if you are feeling stuck, or even just curious, then check out 80,000 Hours for yourself and see if they can help. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 